Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much, and thank you all for all that you are doing in AA and our mom and our team to help this troubled world. And that's what I thought I'd just say a few words to you about, and that is that we have been hearing so much about the past and the present that I thought I'd say just a few words about the future. I think that AA and our love and our team, the three big A's, has got a tremendous potential to help this troubled world out of its great difficulties. And I believe, as Bill did, that the power of its spirit and its spirituality, (laughs) and maybe redundant, (laughs) is really going to overcome so much of our troubles and difficulties. And this is my hope and belief for the future. Thank you. I'm an alcoholic, and my name's Frank. Hi. By the grace of God, the fellowship with men and women like you, and because this program does wake, it hadn't been necessary for me to take a drink today, and for this I'm most grateful. There's no way I can express my gratitude for being allowed to be a part of this 47th celebration of Founders Day of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't get across to you, no matter what I might say, or the feeling that I get to be in this territory, in this area. Really, goose pimples is on me. I've been here before, not to your Founders Day, but for other other deals. And it's just, well, there's no way for me to explain how grateful I am for being a part of this. And I certainly want to thank Lou and the committee of... One, Lou, (laughs) or whoever else might be responsible for Eloise and I being able to be here. It is really, really terrific. Now, many of us are here, many of you are here to pay tribute to Dr. Bob and Bill, and that's as it should be. But I am also here to pay tribute to Lois and to Annie. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't think this thing would have ever happened without those two beautiful, wonderful people. As Willard and I were talking last night, I don't think any either one of them would have been alive at that time had it not been for, for Annie and Lois. And many of us know of the tremendous wake that each one of these ladies did in the early days and of the work that Lois is doing today. So I owe a a great debt of gratitude, not only to Dr. Bob and Bill, but to Annie and Lois. And the more I learn about Dr. Bob, I've known a lot about Bill for many years, but the more I learn about Dr. Bob, the more I just can't imagine a man like that. I remember in reading in one of Dr. Bob's talks, his last major talk, he said, let's never forget the simplicity of this program. And let us never forget that our purpose is to stay sober, get sober and stay sober. And let us not forget our less unfortunate brother. And I'm afraid that many of us are forgetting that less fortunate brother 
You know, we used to be the only outfit left that made house calls. And, and I'm afraid we're getting away from that. I'll try to talk some in the next three or four hours about sponsorship. <laughs> because I'm deeply concerned about it. I mentioned that I was an, I'm an alcoholic, and that's true. I don't really know what alcoholism is other than what Doc Sip was told me and what Bill tells me in the big book, and that's all I want to know about it. I just know if it has anything to do with drinking whiskey, I got it. <laughs> and I don't need to know all those ifs and whys and, and all of that. Now, <clears throat> so I'm not only a, what we commonly refer to as an alcoholic, but I'm a real alcoholic. And if some of you don't have a big book, if you'll get you one and read in there, it mentions many times about the real alcoholic. And I'm not going to tell you what a real alcoholic is, but if you see me after the meeting, well, I'll tell you where in the big book to read, and you can find out whether you're a real alcoholic or not. Now, I'm not only a real alcoholic, I'm an arrested alcoholic. I've been arrested many, many, many times. <laughs> I don't rightfully know how many times I've been arrested. I wish I'd kept up with it. But I didn't know it was going to be a thing of social prestige when I got to the program <laughs> of Alcoholics Anonymous. Who knows? AA may come up with a pension plan. <laughs> and me not knowing how many times I've been arrested, I might lose out on some of my benefits. <clears throat> the text of my sermon this morning is going to be to keep it simple and follow directions. And that's always and still is hard for me to do. I can louse up a one-car funeral <clears throat> by complicating it. And I didn't learn to read just the black part in the book for a long time. I read between the lines and I interpreted. And I said, now this is what Bill really meant. And it took me a long time to get this thing simple and to be able to somewhat follow directions. I mentioned earlier that I think sponsorship is a weakness. It certainly is in my area. I've been impressed up here about the fact that in many of your, pl your recovery places or treatment centers that a person has to have a sponsor before he goes in. And certainly he has one when he comes out. And I think that's terrific. And I think I certainly need to be more mindful about sponsorship. Now, in talking about sponsorship, I had to bring in my original sponsor. He went on to the big meeting some eight or nine years ago. And I can call his last name now because he is there. And he's up there with Bill and Dr. Bob and Bill Dodson and Ethel Macy and all of those. And I'm sure they're looking down this morning smiling and said, keep on, keep on doing what you're doing and try to improve a little bit on respect to your unfortunate brother. And may you, <clears throat> may you always keep this thing simple. And I really believe this. So his name was David Gates. Now, like Brown mentioned last night, he said his sponsor was the most uncouth man he ever saw. He never did meet David Gates. He had absolutely no upbringing, no manners, whatever, no feeling for his for his fellow man. <clears throat> he used a lot of vulgarity when he talked to me. He called me ugly names <clears throat> that I won't repeat in a mixed audience. But he got my attention, <clears throat> and I think that's the only way he could have gotten my attention. He used to take me to a meeting every night. He did this for a long time. He finally told me, he says, well, you're going to have to get there yourself. He says, you get to where you're dependent on us. And I said, David, you know I don't have any wheels. I don't have any way to get there. He said, we, we find walking helps. <clears throat> I'll see you there. The first number of meetings outside of my local group that I went to, he talked. I said, David, don't anybody else talk? He said, nobody you need to hear. <laughs> He, t he took me out to a meeting one night, and he said, now, this is a closed meeting. Well, I didn't know what a closed meeting was, but I sure wasn't going to ask David. 
<clears throat> and I said, you going to talk? He said, no, I'm not going to talk. He said, everybody's going to talk. I said, they're going to let me talk? He said, if they don't run out of time. <laughs> so I started to get out of the car, and he said, sit down. I want to give you some instructions. He believed in those instructions. And he believed in action. He believed when you said something, get on your feet. He said, if they call on you, said, you get up and you say that you're an alcoholic, and your name is Franklin Williams, and you're a member of the Quonset Group, and sit your behind down. <laughs> said, you done told them people all you know. <laughs> now, they didn't let us talk in those days in, Al in Alcoholics Anonymous until we'd been sober for at least a year. And they didn't let us read anything out of the big book at the meetings, a part of the fifth chapter, until we were sober at least 90 days. And I was always, we had a fellow in my group named Allen, and Allen had more degrees than the thermometer. <laughs> But he couldn't stay sober. And he is always telling me that you could learn to drink socially. Now, I didn't know what social drinking was, but it sounded good. <clears throat> if if you go to a, find the right MD and get your capillaries adjusted. <clears throat> well, that's exactly what I wanted to hear, because I didn't come here to stop drinking. And I didn't want to associate with the people that are staying sober. I wanted to associate with the people I, that are slipping. And that was a great word to me. I loved to hear them talk about slipping. <clears throat> so I kept preparing for slips. And by preparing, I had them. <clears throat> so I had to go to David with everything. Now, he didn't let me read anything except the big book and the 12 and 12. Well, I know over a year, it might have been longer than that. But that's the only thing he let me read, and he'd give me tests on it. So I knew, I knew any time I went to him with something, I had to tell him that I had looked for it in the big book. So I told him what, what Alan said. He said, what does the big book say about it? I said, I can't find anything in there about it. He said, must not be important. <laughs> and he believed that. <clears throat> that he said, I told him, I said, Alan says there ain't no must in this program. He said, well, says, for your information, said the word must is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous 74 times. I held services up here in Ohio a number of years ago, and old John over here, old smart ass, he wrote me and sent me a list of these 74 promises. He told me I was wrong. said there's 74 promises and there's 74 musts. And one must not. <laughs> but he said, this is one must that's not in the big book. But said, it's a must for you. Said, rarely have we seen a person stay sober who continues to drink. <laughs> said, you must not drink. Said, you must not swallow any of it. <laughs> and I, I said something about thinking. He said, oh, my Lord, that's the worst thing in the world <clears throat> that a new member of Alcoholics Anonymous can do is think. He said, we'll do your thinking for you for a year. And for the end of a year, if we think you can think, we'll tell you you can think. <laughs> says, you came here when, and your mind was broken. And to use it, it might be fatal. <clears throat> says, don't you attempt to think because your best thinking got you here. <laughs> and I said, David, everywhere you take me, they got them signs all around. Think, think, think. That's for us. <laughs> <laughs> and I really believe that. I, th I think that think deal is the worst thing in the world a new alcoholic can do. I was in a club room, in a club room here not long ago, and they didn't have that think, think, think up there. They had action, action, action. And I like that. Now, I, I didn't have a wife. I didn't have anything when I came here. <clears throat> and I told David one night, I said, it's easy for you folks to stay sober. And I believe Brian mentioned this. You got wives. You got nice threads. You got nice cars. You got nice jobs. You got that scratch and lettuce in your pocket. I don't have any of these things. If I had a wife, I too could stay sober. I read to David for five years out of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, before I found out he could read. 
he knew where everything was, and he'd make me read it to him and explain it to him. And a lot of those things I had to explain to him four and five times before he ever understood. <laughs> he was real hard to catch on. So he said, turn to page 98. And he pointed over there on the left-hand side and said, read this. And it said, as Brown said last night, wife or no wife, job or no job, our sobriety does not depend on others, but in our willingness to trust God and to clean house. He said, now read this on page 99, pointed his finger to it, and I read it. And then he flipped the page and said, read this on page 100, and I read it. He said, what did it say? I said, it says the same thing, David. He said, I know it. He said, Bill figured some cat like you was going to come along, and you'd miss it on page 98. <laughs> but he pointed out all those things to me. I said, David, you know I'm broke. I'd come out to Pennell Farm, and I really didn't have anything, and I was eating at AA uh, meetings. We had noon meetings in Memphis then, have them now. And incidentally, I'm a member of the Quonset Group in Memphis, Tennessee. And I attend on a regular basis the Olive Branch Group in Olive Branch, Mississippi. And we've got two of our members up here at this meeting, and we've got a buddy of mine from Memphis that's up here. They came, they said to keep me straight, but it'll take more than that to do, keep me straight. <laughs> so I'm a member in good standing of both of these groups. And you'd never guess what we do in that, those two groups. We don't do anything except study the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, our people know that big book, and most of them are staying sober. <clears throat> and I think it's, think it's really, really terrific. <clears throat> so I was broke, as I told you. And he told me, he says, you must have a big book. You must have a big book and study that big book. I could ask David what time it was, and he said, don't drink, go to meet and study the big book. Don't drink, go to meet and study the big book. I got so sick of hearing that. He said, you must have a big book. I said, David, ain't no way. I was unemployed, unemployable for a long time. And I said, eating at club rooms and the al would bring sandwiches at, at lunch. And some of those dear ladies would have some extra ones, and they'd say, you may go home tonight, and you might be hungry. And here are a few sandwiches for you to eat. And they knew that that's what I was living on. Now, I'm not saying this for self-pity. I'm saying that all is necessary is to be willing to clean house and to trust God. <clears throat> but I think any of us can stay sober. I know any of us can stay sober if we do those things. So talking about this big book, he said, well, if you haven't got the money to buy you a big book, you go out and steal one says, you haven't forgotten how to steal. <laughs> and said, we got a step in this program. By the time you get on to it, you can make amends for stealing that big book. <laughs> he said, we have to go to any links, and this might be any links. <laughs> any links for you. As far as I'm concerned, I can sum up this whole program with six words. Trust God, clean house, and help others. Now, where do I get this? See, I have to have things simple. When I came in, we didn't have the 24-hour book. It wasn't allowed in our group at that time. We do have it in one of the groups now, and I think it's all right if you use that as a supplementary thing, something to start your day off to get you thinking in the right direction. But we didn't have it. All I had was a big book and the 12 and 12. So I've gotten this trust God, clean house, and help others out of the big book. And where'd I get it? Got part of it from the 11th chapter, the most beautiful series of words and sentences that I ever heard. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you have found and join us. And surely you will meet some of us as you trudge your road to happy destiny. And then didn't Bill say that... Let us burn into the consciousness of every new man. Lois, in the book uh, and the one I have, it didn't have every new member. It says man. And I know why that, that word is put in there. Of every new man, that he too can get sober if he trusts God and clean house. 
And then didn't Bill say that the surest immunity against not drinking is working with others. So trust God, clean house, and help others. Now, this is still meaningful to me. I'll start each day off with that. Because I say I wasn't trained and brought up on the, on the, toy, on the 24 hour book. I know I'd go to David and have the Bible. And I'd want David to read some, me to read some to him out of the Bible. He said, what do you want to read out there for? You profess to be an agnostic. You don't need to be reading out the Bible. I said some good stuff in there. <laughs> he said, well, maybe at the end of a year, we, of a, one year, we'll let you read out the Bible, but we want it thoroughly understood. It's not conference approved literature. <laughs> <laughs> he believed in that conference approved literature. None of you realize how hard it was for Eloise to get here this time. And I'll talk, mention that well on down the line. But she is really excited, and has been excited about getting to come here. Now, Eloise don't get to go to as many places as I do because she works. <laughs> and I certainly try not to do anything to interfere with that gal's work. <laughs> But I want it thoroughly understood that that gal don't have to work. Darn it, she can go naked and starve death if she wants to. <laughs> That's the decision she has to make. Decisions are bad on me. I had to make a decision before I stood up here whether to go to the bathroom or not. And right now, I made the wrong decision. <laughs> Like, like Brown, I met Eloise in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have her permission to say that she's an alcoholic. She has over 23 years, is that right, Eloise? Over 23 years of sobriety. <clears throat> Incidentally, I have 25 years, nine months and something. October the 15th, 1956. <clears throat> No, that I'm not due that applause. It's A A N God as I understand. And so the only reason I'm telling you this is because I'm bragging. <laughs> Obviously I am because my mother passed away last October with over ninety two years of consecutive sobriety. <laughs> and she never mentioned it. <laughs> I mentioned earlier I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get sober. And I'm sure there's nobody else in this room that came for such an ulterior motive. But I came to get my tail out of the crack and get some pressure off of me, and maybe I could learn to drink without getting into trouble, like Brown is talking about. Because that's really what I wanted to do. I want to get back just a second on that sponsorship deal. Now, this may be controversial to some of you, and I don't give a rap whether it is or not. I'll give you the right to be wrong. <laughs> I, I really do feel strongly about sponsorship, and I don't think that I am qualified to be a sponsor unless I have worked the steps to the best of my ability. Now, why do I say this? How is someone going to explain to me how to take the fourth step if he or she never has taken that fourth step themselves? We got a boy at home says you can't no more teach what you ain't learned and you can come back from where you ain't been. <laughs> and I really believe this. Now, I'm not saying that you are not qualified to go out and make a 12-step call. But I think anyone who even knows anything about Alcoholics Anonymous has got a message of hope by going out and doing that. But I think you can tell that person, as many in the audience have been told, I don't know how this thing works, but I'll take you to where the message is. But when it really gets down to sponsoring that fellow, I think a sponsor's got to listen when he needs to listen and shut the fellow up when he needs to shut him up. 
and tell him what to do, and not only tell him, but walk with him along the way and help him as he does this. This is what David did with me. He explained these steps to me the way that the big book explained them. I think there's a lot more bad information in Alcoholics Anonymous than there is good information. <clears throat> I'm hearing people say, you don't have to write a fourth step. You can take this thing cafeteria style. If you don't like that step, you can skip it. Well, they're not reading the same book I am because the instructions that Bill left us is it's, it's spelled out there plainly that when you finish one step, it says now you are ready for the next step. So people can say they don't know when to take a certain step. Well, they're not reading the book. <coughs> So I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in 19, in January 1956, and I drank, I slipped for a period of nine months till October the 15th, 1956. And I'm not going into a blow by blow deal of my drinking because we all know how, how to drink. There's a lot in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous how to live. And that's what I want to devote most of my time to. I started drinking when I was 16 years of age, and I started for the same reason that many people do, because of peer pressure, because of the people with whom I was associating were drinking, and they seemed to be having the fun, and I wanted to join in, and I did. And I drank for a period of 29 years. I was an alcoholic from the first drink I ever took. I stole the first drink they ever took. Two brothers, not my brothers, but two brothers, we stole some corn whiskey from the daddy, and I blacked out. Twenty-nine years later, I stole some wine, and I blacked out. Now, in twenty-nine years, I gave it the best shot I had. And I didn't learn a way to drink and not get into trouble. I suffered the same loneliness, the same futile feeling of futility, the same feeling of not being a part of, of being rejected. And I had that god awful guilt and fear, and I never, I've never known an alcoholic that didn't have these. David said I didn't have any guilt. He said I never was sorry till I was caught. <clears throat> and I don't know but what he is right, but maybe it's remorse. But I, I, I know there was something there just eating that gut out. I don't think it's the physical suffering that got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the mental suffering and that feeling of guilt. And knowing that something bad was going to happen. If it didn't happen this five minutes, it's going to happen the next five minutes. I was looking for something that took care of right now. I knew that I was going to black out. I knew I was going to wind up in jail. But it eased that old feeling down in my gut. Something for right now. And it wasn't until I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I found something that would take care of right now. And there's nothing that can come up in my life today that there's not an answer for it in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous for right now. So I started to go into AA, not for me, but try to get my wife back, get police off my back, and a number of other things. So really it's important to me, why did I come to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous? This is a suggested program. And the judge suggested that I come. And he put it in the form of an order. So you know if I came to wake people, I didn't come to wake programs. So I just thank God that it was only a period of nine months before I really got on the drunk of all drunks. It wasn't as bad as many that I had been in. I didn't suffer as much physically or mentally. But it was a time that I was ready to throw in the towel. David used to always tell me, surrender, surrender. Most important thing in Alcoholics Anonymous, surrender. I got so darn tired of listening to that. I said, David, what in the world is surrender? And how do you do it? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but says, one of these days or one of these nights is possibly going to be late in the night or early in the morning. You're going to be hurting. You're going to be feeling alone. You're going to have a lot of fear. And you're going to drop down on your knees, even though you profess to be an agnostic. And you're going to ask a God that you don't know or understand to help you. 
and said, that's as near as I can tell you what surrender is. And he said, try to think of something in your life that you can associate with a surrender. And I didn't have any problem along this area. Because when I was in college, and I love to tell you I went to college, <laughs> so you'll know I'm educated. <clears throat> now, Eloise says I'm educated way beyond my intelligence. <laughs> and Miss and Eloise again a number of years ago I don't remember years too much they slipped by so quickly but a number of years ago she switched over and went into Al-Anon and she's what Lois and a group call a double winner things were real real rough at our house I mean real rough. And I don't know how in the world we stood it during the first ten years or so of our marriage. We were one another's throat all the time. Eloise had a ten-year-old daughter when we married. And that daughter grew to hate me. And she used to shake her finger in my face and tell me, you're not my daddy and you don't have anything to do with me. And things were real rough. So Eloise has a friend in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that some of my friends here from Tuscaloosa know, singing. And singing very quietly, and that's the only way it could have been done, said, Eloise, you need to go to al -Anon. Now, Eloise is not a person who does things in instantly. Well, you can look at her and tell she's in her 18th year now of a 12-day diet. <laughs> <laughs> so she she had to think about that thing a long time. So she finally did go. And Eloise fell in love with Alan. She got busy, she studied the program. She <clears throat> went to al -Anon on a regular basis. She sponsored a lot of gals. And she is really gung-ho on al -Anon. And I've heard her say many, many times that she learned more about letting go and letting God in the pro program of al -Anon than she ever did in AA and releasing with love. <clears throat> So my head is off to al -Anon. I think before anything is really meaningful to me, I have to experience it. And I've had an experience as a result of this. Now, lest you al feel too smugly, we drunks got you where you are today. <laughs> <laughs> and don't, don't you forget it. All right. <clears throat> That, that night of October the 15th, of October the 14th, really, I decided that I was going to take my life. And I've never known an alcoholic that that hadn't entered his mind. Don't many of us do it because we don't have the guts to do it. We don't want to hurt. And I had made some feeble attempts prior to that, but I was sure that someone was close by that could get to me and say, you poor dear. And then I had them. But this night, I really intended to do it. I had st stolen a piece of plastic hose, and stealing was a way of life with me, just like drinking. I'd borrowed a car, and I'd hooked up that, that hose to the exhaust. And I'd run the, the hose in the left window, and that was how I was going to do it. And I'd written a farewell note. And I know David had given me a yellow legal pad to take my inventory on. And I had that yellow legal pad, and I was writing that farewell note. And I don't know about you when you're drinking, but I just love to cry. And I was staying in a garage apartment as great as a friend's, and they had an old graffinola in there with a horn out from it. You had to wind it up. And <clears throat> this this person had a Al Jolson Sonny Boy record. Oh, I love to cry by that. <laughs> and had some old hillbilly music, and that was good. And nobody loves me. 
I just love to play that. <clears throat> but that old Graf Noel had a peculiarity about it. About halfway through the record, it would slow down. So you'd have to jump up and run over there and crank it up again. Well, I'd just slow my crying down to keep time with the music. <laughs> and then as it began to pick up, I'd pick up. So I was writing that farewell note. I'm going on. You can have everything. I had it all on. <laughs> and I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And I was crying all the time, tears dropping down on that old legal pad, and the bottom of the page got some moist pen wouldn't write. And I drew an arrow up to the top, see next page. <laughs> And I got thinking about my funeral and, and all the people that are going to be there. And I could see my wife looking down at the corpse and saying, you poor dear, if I had only understood. And she had two idiot brothers <coughs> that may be an alcoholic. And they were on either side of her looking down and saying, honey, if you had understood old Franklin, he'd still be living. And then she had two dumb skull doctors, cousins that were doctors, and they were on either side. And one of them had tried to bug me to send me to Whitfield, a mental institution, insane asylum. And the other one had tried to send me to Keeley, up there close to Chicago. And they were looking down. He said, honey, if you'd have left old Franklin down there in Mississippi where we could take care of him, he'd still be living. Now, I don't want you to think I had to self-pity. <laughs> so I cried all I could cry, and I went on out to the car and started the motor. And a peculiar thing happened. I never did drink that wine like I drank it. You really missed something. And it's too late now. But you talk about a spiritual awakening, us old wine old stayed in one. You just up here in the air floating and grinning and scratching. <laughs> so I went back to polish off that last little spot of wine, and another peculiar thing happened. I passed out. And somewhere around 1 or 1.30 the early morning of October the 15th, I waked up. Now, I didn't come to. I waked up. And there's a difference. Apparently clear of mine. And my whole life passed before me. And I saw things in a perspective I'd never seen before. And I knew where the, what the problem was, and I knew where the solution was. And I fell to my knees, and for the first time in my adult life, I said a honest and sincere prayer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to me, this is surrender. I called on a God I did not know nor understand for help. And I don't know what I said other than God help me. But I think that's as great a prayer as a suffering alcoholic can offer. I think there are two real important things about prayer. And the first one is start doing it. And the second one is keep on doing it. And it don't make any difference. I said don't make any difference. You don't have to believe to begin with. The book don't say that we believe. It says we can to believe. And I can guarantee you if you start doing it and keep on doing it, you'll come to believe. You don't even have to believe that cast oil will work. If you go through the action of taking it, I guarantee you it'll work. And if you'll go through the action of offering a prayer, and it don't make any difference what you say, as long as you're sincere, even if you just as I did, say, God, help me. And so I started doing this, and I kept on doing it, and I'm still doing it. So I was on my knees that early morning of October the 15th. I don't know how long I stayed there, and it's not important, but I stayed there long enough. I stayed there long enough to make a decision and to make a contract. And I took the first three steps of this program to the best of my ability that early morning. <clears throat> I admitted there was absolutely no way in the world that I could drink alcohol 
safely and not get into trouble. I could not control the amount I was going to drink. I couldn't stop when I wanted to stop, and I could not guarantee what my actions were going to be. I accepted this at a gut level, and there was absolutely no way in the world I could keep from drinking. Therefore, I was powerless over alcohol. Lack of power was certainly my dilemma. And I had done things I hadn't intended to do, and I'd left undone the things I had intended to do. Therefore, my life was unmanageable, and an unmanageable life to me is just that simple. Now, if my life was unmanageable, I need to manage it. And I remembered you told me something about this <coughs> in step two. Now, if my life's unmanageable and I need a manager, it makes sense that I turn my life and will over to this manager. And that's what you told me to do in step three. And my sponsor told me that the only important thing, or the most important thing about step three was a decision. He said everything else in that step would change. And it certainly has with me. Made a decision to turn my life and will. I didn't know what my life and will was. Today I know. My life is my actions and my will is my thinking. Oh, to the care of God is our understanding. I still don't understand God, but my understanding today is more than what it was 26 years ago. It's different from what it was five years ago. It's different from what it was a year ago. And I'll never completely understand God, because if I could, I'd be as big as He is. And I'm just awed at the power of this there. But I can keep on doing these things, and I'll have a better understanding because I'll have experiences, which, which I'll talk about. Now, I knew that before this God that I did not understand was going to move my house and live with me. I had to first clean it up. And I remembered you had told me about this in steps four through ten. So I set about to do these. But let me back up. I got it back in bed and slept soundly until around six or six thirty. This is against what a wino like me would do. I'd doze off or pass out and wake up and slip down and get some of that mystic oil of joy to slip me back into the arms of Morpheus and then come to again and do the same thing. Well, this time I didn't. And that thing of being clear of mind in a wino is just never clear of mind. And I was clear of mind. So I waked up around 6 or 6.30, went to the back door of the people that I was living, asked if I could call David, and told him what had happened, and I didn't understand it, come over there. So he came. He sat down on the end of that bed, and he told me many things about old David. And I'm sure he'd told me most of these before, but I hadn't heard them. Chuck says one of the most profound things I ever heard. We see when we see, and we hear when we hear. And another philosopher, old Yogi Berra, old baseball player, <clears throat> he says, if you want to see something, it's good that you be there because you can see it better. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard it that morning, and I, I began to pour out to David things that I had never told another human being. And David said two words which, in my opinion, saved my life. He said, I understand. No one had ever told me that they understood. But I could tell from the look in his eye and the expression on his face that he did understand. I knew it at a gut level. And he said, they're going to get some of your time. And he's talking about the men in blue down to local Castile. And they did get some of my time. And they sent me to the penal farm. Now, I tell you, I knew I had to have this program, and we started a AA group at the penal farm, and it's still there. <coughs> and I knew that I had to have this, and it's the first time in my life I ever did something without wanting brownie points, something in return, because I knew this had to be for me. And I tried to sober up every drunk that came to that penal farm. I even tried to sober up the warden. And he didn't even have a drinking problem. <laughs> but it's good for me because it kept me busy. And in the time that I was supposed to stay there, I got out. It took a long time for me to get a job because I couldn't be bonded. 
And the only kind of wake I knew anything about, I had to be bonded. So I had to spend a lot of time around AA. And I'm grateful for that. I hear some people say they're alcoholics because they drank too much too long. I didn't. I drank just enough, just long enough. I think one drink more might have been too many, one drink less might have been one too little. So I thank God for all of this. Like Brock, I'm grateful for having gone to the penal farm because it took that to bring me to my knees and to get me where I am today. I think it takes what it takes for each and every every one of us. So I set about to do these steps just the way that the big book says and the way David was explained. And I think I worked them to the best of my ability. I just didn't have much ability. And I can see now that I wasn't capable of getting honest enough. And when when I talk about honesty in AA, I'm not talk, talking about cash register honesty. I'm talking about self-honesty. I'm talking about being void of self-deception. That, to me, is honesty with me. And I hope that I'm making a little progress in that area. Because I went along for a period of between nine and ten years, and I'm saying this for several reasons. I'm saying it for myself, but I'm also saying it to maybe there's someone in this audience that has a little sobriety or a lot of sobriety and is getting uncomfortable. And you're beginning to feel nervous and irritable and discontented that Dr. Bob talks about. And I know that if I continue to feel this way, I'm going to reach for that drink. And I don't want any more of this. So I reached that point. And David used to get to the meeting an hour early, and I did too. He required me to, even after that much sobriety. And we'd stay at least an hour after the meeting. And I think that with me, the meetings before the meetings and the meetings after the meetings are the best meetings that I went to. Because a lot of these were one-on-one -on -one with David. And by that time, I had learned to respect David. And I loved him. And incidentally, to begin with, I hated his guts. And if you have a sponsor and after 60 or 90 days you like him, you've got the wrong sponsor. Because <laughs> he's not telling you the truth. But old David told me the truth. And that night down there, I said, David, I'm getting nervous and irritable and discontented. And there's something wrong. I want to talk to you about it. He said, I know it. He said, I've been trying to approach you on this for several months, but you had a wall built up and you wouldn't let me get through. And I've been praying that you'd come to me or you'd go to somebody else and get this out and open before you got drunk. And God has answered my prayer. He said, can you stay sober until now, from now until Saturday? That was on Monday night. I said, yes, I can. I'll be miserable as a devil, but I can stay sober. He said, I know you can stay sober if you do what I tell you. He said, the first thing I'm going to tell you not to go to any meetings between now and then. Now, that don't sound right, but let me finish it. He said, I want you to stay at home and not read the big book, but study the first four chapters in the doctor's opinion. He said, do you know why I want you to do this? I said, no. He said, turn to page six, turn to fifth chapter after the ABCs. <coughs> And read me the first few words after the ABCs. And I read them and it says, being convinced we are ready for step three. Being convinced of what? Of the ABCs. What are the ABCs? They're purely and simply the first two steps. David told me and I believe it. Nowhere in our AA literature does it tell us how to take the first two steps. You don't take them. You become convinced of them. It says so in chapter 5. He said, how do you become convinced of it? David said they got the doctor's opinion in there in the first four chapters that leads up to this. He said, I want you to thoroughly study that doctor's opinion. I think it's one of the greatest pieces of information that we have. As Brown said last night, it nails us to a T. It tells us who is an alcoholic. It tells us what our problem is. And it tells us what the solution is. And then on in the rest of the book, it tells us how to get this. The doctor's opinion's in the right place. Bill put it there so we'd study that first. So I really studied this thing. He said, you need to learn from the doctor's opinion that you are not 
a bad person trying to get good. You are a sick person trying to get well. And you have a sickness, and you are not a no good moral dairy. And then he says, really study Bill's story to the agnostic, more about alcoholism, in fact, the first four chapters. He said, if you study these, you will be convinced of the first two steps. And I believe this. And I did it. And the people with whom that I work with, I have them to do this because I know it works. So then <clears throat> we spent the day out on the lake that Saturday. And when we got ready to go in, why well, he had me to read there about the third step, how to take it. And you know after nearly ten years in this program, I didn't know that Bill said, suggested that we take the third step with another human being. And I didn't know that he suggested a prayer in that. See, I had a mental block against these things. There again, that ego was in the way and that honesty was in the way. Self-deception. So he had me to read <coughs> the third step prayer. And after I read it, he said, I'd like to hear you say it in your own words, and I think God would too. And we knelt down by a log. And I said the third step prayer. This is not exactly the same words, but it's what I say all the time now. <clears throat> God, I offer myself to thee to do with me and build of me what as I will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those that I might help of thy love, thy <clears throat> service, and thy way of life. May I always do thy will. David said, we all right up to now. And I looked down at David, and I was taller than he, and tears were running down his cheeks, and tears were running down mine. And I embraced David and told him I loved him. It's the first time in my adult life I'd ever told a man I loved him. I know way back years before then, David told me he loved me. And I didn't say it because I didn't have guts enough to say it. But I thought, you're not one of those, are you? <laughs> but see, that was my conception of love at that time. And it had changed by, by this time. I knew a little bit about what love was. David said, we all right up to now. Now let's get into the fourth step. He had me to read the three areas of my life to examine. Of course, I read before that that selfishness and self-centeredness we think is the root of our problem. And I've certainly found it to be the root of mine. But he had me to list the three areas of my life to examine. <clears throat> First, resentments, because resentments is the number one enemy. Secondly, fears, and third, sex. And he said, put, put each of these headings at the top of three separate pages. And he says, we've talked enough that I know you've got so many resentments that one page is not going to do. <laughs> but have your headings down there. And he said, take a little memorandum pad with you in your pocket, and along during the day as you think of things, jot it down in there. Then when you come back to your room, put it on your inventory. <clears throat> so I got to work on this. He told me to look at page 65, where it gives us a format of how to get our resentments. He told me, says, when I first told you to write an inventory, you started on it, and you were writing a life history. And you brought part of it to me and let me read it, and I tore it up and told you you're a lie to go back and do it right and do it according to the book. He said, Bill, don't say anything about writing the life history. Bill says we've got to get on to cause and effects. Cause and effects. What caused me to do this and what effect did it have on me? He said, if you write a life history, you're worse off by doing that than not taking any inventory at all. And said, the reason you are is because you're you're bringing these events into the light that you've done. You're not finding the cause. You're not finding the effect. And the only thing you're doing is increasing guilt. And I believe this. I take fifth step with a lot of people, and I don't, I don't let nobody take a fifth step with me that writes a life history. I don't let them take it with me if they're using one of these recovery house deals for a fifth step. We had the fifth step before they knew anything, the fourth step before they knew anything about it. And I was awake, and I don't know about that. 
I don't know anything about it. I only know about mine, and that's the way I'm going to, I'm going to try to do is to go by that big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it said, read me that first resentment up there. <clears throat> I resent Mr. Brown. Why? Because of his attentions to my wife. What effect does it have on me? It affects my sex life. It affects my security. It affects my companionship. And then David said, before you go any further, I said, Bill either didn't know this about it then or didn't have room to put it all in the big book. But in the 12 and 12, he goes into depth more about this. I want you to read me the first paragraph in the explanation of step four in the 12 and 12. And says, what it is is it's three God-given instincts. We have an instinct for sex, an instinct for emotional and material security, and we have an instinct for companionship. Now, the book goes on to say there's nothing wrong with these because they're God-given. But where I get into trouble is in threatening or abusing one or more of these God-given instincts. Then he had me to read about the seven cardinal sins, and I'll only mention pride because pride is at the head of the list, and it should be that. And here's an example of me threatening. Suppose I want something, and I don't get it, and I even pray for it, which I'm not supposed to do. But let it be at that. I don't get it. All right, pride steps in and says, Franklin, what a heck of a nice fellow you are. You deserve that. Then when I don't get it, fear steps in. I have found out that the end result with me is fear, but I'll get back to that. that he said, in how it affects you, use one or more of the God-given instincts. Right, as an example, I resent Mr. Brown. Why? Because of his attention to my wife. How does this affect me? It affects my sex life. It affects my emotional security, and it affects my <clears throat> my companionship. And I went all the way through it. And in every instant, one or more of the three basic instincts was threatened or abused. Then what is the end result? On page 65, you'll see in parentheses say after every one of them is fear. So... <clears throat> Then it says on further in the 12 and 12 that any time my basic desire or my real desire in life is to satisfy my basic instincts, then I'm in trouble. What is that but saying I'm trying to satisfy a human ego? There ain't no way in the world you can satisfy a human ego. We got a fellow in my area that loves to fish and he loves to drink and he does it both at the same time most of the time. But here several years ago he was going late in the fall and things were frozen over and this mental place had more minnows than he could sell. They were just dying. So this old drunk stopped by and said, how much are your minnows? The man said, all you want for a dollar. He said, give me three dollars worth. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no way you can satisfy a human ego. So I really have found, what have I found out about old Franklin? I found out that my problem is ego. My real problem is ego. The end result is fear. And this is why I can understand that Bill, in my opinion, was divinely inspired in this deal. Why he stresses so much deflation of ego. Seven of our steps have to do with house cleaning. I think before God can use me, he's first got to destroy me. He's got to get rid of as much ego as possible. Self-pity, all of these deals. <clears throat> so I found out that my real problem is ego, and the end result is fear. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. I listed the people that I had harmed under my resentments. I listed my fears, and I listed my sex deal, and I found out what caused them and what the end result was. Then David had me to read what to do in step five. So I went, David and I went back out on the lake. And I took step five with David, and he took his fifth step with me. Certainly he took that part of it which related to mine. And that helped because it helped to reduce guilt, and it showed me somebody else in the world had thought and done as I did. And I try to do this, or I do do this, with people with whom I take the fifth step with. Then he had me to read about step six and seven. Page 76 is the only page in the big book that has four steps explained on it. And it don't take much explanation to do. 
<coughs> become entirely ready to have our character defects removed. I read that the only thing that I could really do there was to pray for willingness. That's what the book says. So I prayed for willingness. Men would have come, why well, take step, take seven. Humbly ask him to remove my shortcomings. Now this may be controversial. The book don't say this. But I think this is what happened to me. I don't think God is going to do anything for me that I can do for myself. I don't think my character defects have been removed completely. I know this is a shock to you. <laughs> I think they are being replaced. I don't think that, as I say, God's going to do something for me that I can do for myself. I think what has happened is that God has afforded me the opportunity to practice the opposite of his character defect. And as long as I'm practicing the opposite, I can't have that character defect. For instance, there's no way that I can have self-pity if I'm practicing gratitude, and so on down the line. And as long as that pendulum is swinging to the right instead of to the left, well, I'm all right. But you let me get back to practicing these these negatives, and they are going to come back into my life. Neither do I think that my obsession to drink has been removed. I don't have it today. I think it has is being replaced. David was great on having me look up words. He had me to look up obsessions. And one of the definitions was an idea that overpowers any other idea. I have an idea today that overpowers any other idea that I want to stay sober more than anything in the world. And as long as I have that obsession and do the things you're teaching me to, take, to do, I cannot have the obsession to drink. So I think mine is being replaced. Now, another reason I don't think I'll ever get rid of all of my character defects is because I'll never completely get rid of ego. If I could completely get rid of ego, I could become perfect. And only one person ever did that, and you know what they did to him. And God knows I don't want to become perfect because I don't know who in the devil I'd associate with. Then step eight. He had me to read there what to do. He said, you made, you made this list in step four when you took your inventory. And the only thing you can do now is pray for willingness. And I prayed for willingness. And when I became willing, I made amends. I had to do some, I had him to do some arguing with me about some of it. But I made amends everywhere except when to do so with his and others. I had a hard time accepting my father because he is dead. And I couldn't make amends, and David got across to me the mere fact that I was willing to suffice. So I don't have that guilt anymore. And I'm trying to keep all of this slate clean. <clears throat> Continue to take a personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. Promptly can mean 10 days, 2 weeks, or 30 days with me a lot of times, depending on how badly I hurt. Pain is the thing that's motivated me to do <clears throat> everything that I've done in the program for improvement. But when I hurt long enough, I, <clears throat> I do something about it. I surrender. I don't think I told you about the instance about this surrender. I, I thought back to when I was in college and this old boy named Red McGinnis there. And this is meaningful to me today. Just as much so, if not more so, than it was nearly 26 years ago. But I made the mistake one day of smarting off to Red McGinnis. And he darn near killed me. Next thing I knew, I was trying to get up off the floor. And every time I tried to get up, Red McGinnis knocked me back down. And I never laid a hand on Red McGinnis. But had it not been for some compassionate people that pulled him off, I might believe he'd have killed me. Now that was over 50 years ago. And if Red McGinnis come in this room today, ain't no way I'd say anything smart to Red McGinnis. <laughs> I completely and unconditionally surrendered to Red McGinnis. <laughs> now, that's surrender. And if it's too complicated for you to understand, get you something you can understand. I can understand it. I said it's important to me today. It is. David taught me to talk to myself. He said it's not Franklin that gets you into trouble. It's the little Franklin. And says, what you've got to do is talk to him and put him in his place. Y'all go over in the corner and count yourself. 
And so we go over in the corner and count ourselves, and I say, Little Franklin, you get me in a devil of shape. What me and you got to do is have a red and to surrender to God. And I know what I'm talking about, and I think Little Franklin knows what I'm talking about. So it's these simple things with me, and then following directions, <laughs> that make this program so much more easy and so much more more beautiful. I like an attempt step to operate an automobile. There's some daily things, almost daily things I've got to do to an automobile. Got to check the tires, air on the top, water in the radiator, water in the batteries, put oil in the transmission, put gas in the tank, a number clean the windshield, a number of daily things. But I can operate that automobile for a certain length of time, and I've got to have a major overhaul. And that's the way it is with old Franklin's life. After I run this thing along for a long, good long while, some things crop up in my conscious mind, I think because I'm getting a little bit more honest. And I've got to go back and get the master mechanic, and we've got to do a major overhaul. And that's what we attempt to do. Now, I think... Many people, and alcoholics and anonymous, don't really know how to take this four step. And I, I think part of the fact is due to lack of sponsorship. The bill says that the real purpose of this program prepares, prepares to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. And many of us hadn't worked those steps correctly to be of maximum service. I don't know how many people are in Alcoholics Anonymous, a million, whatever. But just think, if every one of us prepared ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us, and then sponsored one person a year, the way David Gates sponsored me, look how this thing would, would, would run. And I think that's what Lois is talking about this morning, the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we have a grave, I have a grave responsibility. And I hope you, you do too. <clears throat> Sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact. This implies I've had a previous contact. I sure did in step two and three. But I thought step two in the beginning said came to believe in God. And I later found out it said came to believe that God. I came to believe in God as a result of working the other steps and having some experiences. That thing of prayer and meditation, I've learned more about prayer and meditation in the last five years. I've been retired approximately five years, and I have the battle of my life. I think possibly the greatest thing I've learned is that God is, that God is. Bill says in the early part of the book, God is or he is not. Yes, that's simple. I've had experiences. And I know that God is. I know where these experiences came from. I know the source of them. <clears throat> so this is a gut level feeling that God is. I spend a lot of time, I have some physical problems, and I spend a lot of time in a recliner. I don't know whether I have to or not, but I do. <clears throat> and after I get Eloise off to wake in the morning, I lean back in this recliner, and I say my six words, and I have the big book there, and I have the 12 and 12, and I have a tape recorder, and I have the big book on tape, and I have the 12 and 12 on tape, and I'll either read something or turn on the recorder. I'm lazy, and I'll get to listening, and I'll get to thinking about old Willard, <clears throat> different ones that I know in the program, and what has happened to them as a result of them applying the steps of this program to their life. And then I get to thinking about my own and the fact that I suddenly realize that God is doing for me what I could not do for myself. And I'm really awed at the power that's in the program, the power that's in this program. I can't understand it. I'm not supposed to. But I'm really awed at it. So I get to... I, he had me also to look up believe, and one of the definitions of believe is to rely. And I am coming to rely on the forgiveness of God for yesterday and the grace of God for tomorrow. And that only leaves today. And there's nothing that can come up in my life today that I can't handle if I turn it over to God. 
And how do I know this? Because of trying. How else do I know it? <clears throat> because Bill says in the big book that the problem ahead is never greater than the power behind. And I have another way of putting this. There's no limit to where I can go because I'll never run out of God. I'll never run out of God. And that's a comforting thought. The problem ahead is never greater than the power behind. I'll tell you an experience that happened in our lives in the last six weeks or something like that. The first Monday in May, Eloise went in the hospital. Some month or two prior to that, she had slipped on some ice and bruised herself all in a dolly part. And <laughs> <laughs> And she was sore, <laughs> so they had her to come in for examination. And Friday of that week, they removed both breasts, and both were malignant. They found a little more malignancy. So they started to give her chemotherapy. Now, this is a heck of a blow. But she accepted that thing right off. I wasn't long accepting. And we couldn't have done this without this program. The problem ahead is never greater than the power behind. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that I'm great, but I am trying to tell you I'm applying this program. And we turn this over to God. And I'm truthful about this. And we are going about our way, and he's directing us and taking care of us. Except the things you can't change. We can talk about it real easy, but sometimes to do it is entirely different. Eloise said she had a devil of a lot easier time than I did because she's in two programs. A.A. and al and she had two programs, and I only had one. <laughs> but this thing is working. You know, this thing of taking a fourth and fifth step has been a turning point in my life in, in A.A. Why is it necessary that I, David asked me, he said, do you know why you need to take a fourth step? I said, yeah, I know what the book says. He said, the book don't say this. <laughs> he said, you need to take the fourth step so you can take the fifth step. <laughs> said, there ain't no way you can take the fifth step till you take the fourth step. He said, turn to page 72. <laughs> he pointed down there at the bottom of the page, said, read this. And then the top of page 73 said, those who do not take this vital step, the fifth step, do not relieve their alcoholism. Invariably, they drink again. They haven't learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty by telling it all to another human being. And the word all is in italics. Now, I've taken many fourth and fifth steps since that time some many years ago. And why did I do it? First, because David showed me in the big book that I need to do it. I don't know what page it's on in the new 12 and 12, but in the old 12 and 12, it's on pages 51 and 52. The bottom of 51, the top of 52. The taking of a four-step inventory is but the beginning of a lifetime process. So I am going back and doing more and more of this. And I think God is allowing me as I do a little bit about something. I think God lets me see something when I do something about it. He lets me see something else. And things are coming to my conscious mind now that have, haven't been there. And I know what I need to do now. I'm getting a little bit more honest and I need to do something about that. And I'm doing it now because of the relief and the release that I get by doing it. Having had a spiritual awakening, this scared the stew out of me. I said, David, that's too churchy. He said, turn to Appendix 2. And he had me to read the first part of Appendix 2. It says that the spiritual awakening is purely and simply a personality change. Which said, you ain't got no darn personality, so don't worry about it. <laughs> you just keep on doing these things. Then he said, read on down further in the 12 and 12, in the, uh, Appendix 2, because I'd had so much trouble with what many of us referred to as a God anger. And it says, many of us believe 
that an unsuspected power has entered our lives. And is this is not the exact wording, but it's done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And in essence, the awareness of this is in essence a spiritual awakening. The simple awareness of this is a spiritual awakening. And that helped me tremendously in the accepting a power greater than myself and being able to call it God. So having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the first 11 steps, which I took this message and practiced these principles. Took what message? There's an old black boy down in Little Rock, Arkansas, I love dear Joe MCQ. Brian knows him well. Many others know him. And I should say I said this, but some of you will go back and tell Joe I said that. And it might give him a resentment, and he might get drunk. And I don't want that to happen to Joe because I love him too much. So Joe said this. He said the greatest carrier of a message was a man named Paul Revere. said he rode through the countryside yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming. Not one picture does it ever say, show Paul Revere looking back. Not one picture did he ever stop and get on off that horse and say, now, if I was you, I'd do this about your marital problem, about your, about your financial problem, your illegal problem. No, he told it one simple message, the British are coming. Now, Joe stopped it there. He didn't say this, I said this. <laughs> the message took care of itself. When he told them the British are coming, them cats knew to haul ass. <laughs> And so it is with our program. If we stick to the message, I only have one message to take, and you as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, only have one message, and the 12th step tells me what that message is. The message of a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. I can't give advice on all this other stuff. I do, but I ain't supposed to. I got one message. Practice these principles, the 12 steps of the principles, but I'll only mention one principle, love. And that's the apex of the whole deal. That's what all men of the cloth, everybody's trying to get across is love. I have come to believe. Sure. It's all right, honey. Uh, you don't break. To see and experience. The miraculous power of love. This power in love. The members of the Quonset group in Memphis, Tennessee, love this old drunk soul. From up here, you can feel the love in this audience out here. There's a tremendous power in love. And I just hope that today, that instead of being addicted to alcohol, I am becoming addicted to love. I'll close the way I always close. It's not much of a story, but I just like the way I tell it. <laughs> and I I like to hear it, and I haven't heard it today. So if you just bear with me, I'll tell it to Franklin again. <laughs> I just like to believe that the God of my understanding is saying unto me this Sunday morning, Franklin, I'm getting up a football team, and I'm going to make you the quarterback. I'm going to give you three men in the backfield that you lost you in your act of alcoholism. I'm going to give them back to you in the race order in which you lost them. I'm going to give you hope, faith, and charity. I'm going to give you seven powerful men in the line. These men you were introduced to in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you would use these men, they'd block out resentment, self-pity, intolerance, impatience. All of the stumbling blocks that caused you so much trouble the first 45 years of your life. At the two ends, I'm going to give you patience and tolerance. At the two tackles, uh, <coughs> humility and honesty. And at the two guards, unselfishness and gratitude. And at center, willingness. Now, it'll be necessary that you use willingness on every play. Now, this game is going to last a lifetime. There'll be no timeouts. So I'm not only the sole official, the referee and the sole official, but I am the whole deal. I'm your manager and your coach and the sole official. So I'm going to have to give you some ground rules. And these ground rules are the Ten Commandments. And the first four of these commandments have to do with your relationship with your manager and your coach God. And the last six of these commandments have to do with your relationship with your teammates. Now, the ball is your eternal soul, 
and the goalposts to the gates of heaven. Now get in there and play ball. I need each and every one of you in my search for truth in this game of life. And I thank God for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for the God of my understanding. And if you don't believe that this program will work, just keep it simple and follow directions. And if you don't believe that God will help you, just ask him. Thank you, and God bless you, and I love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.